Good morning, good morning. Thank you for joining us for yet another Sunday's household talk. You welcome our family. We are live as usual on Facebook and on Zoom. Ezra, you are welcome. I see you again on Zoom. Please let's feel comfortable. Let's have fun. Let's have a good time today. It's good to see you, Ezra. Recording in progress. Let's see you, Mwape. Today, my co-host is right in the same room as I am next to me. She will join us. You want to say something? Bye. Hi. Okay. Let's uh, begin the household talk. Thank you for joining us every time, folks. Uh, family, you are you are you are now my family because of a lot of things we have shared together. I feel excited and I feel strengthened. By the way, I turned 50 yesterday. I think I look 50. Thank God for that. Half a century. But uh, I want to appreciate you mostly, folks. You family members. For every time coming to speak with us, be with us. Listen to these talks. They are good talks. They are family talks. Sometimes I would call them far, far side chats. Because they, they really make us, they remind us, they bring us into a place where we begin to look at life the way it should, it should be looked at. They bring us understanding truth. So you're welcome, folks. Last Sunday we were discussing Paul, and it was a very interesting topic. Today, I want us to continue looking at Paul and how he matters in what we are trying to discuss how his understanding of truth can help the whole world. Remember, like we said, this message is for the world. It's for the, for the about this. Are we nine million now on this earth? It's, it's, it's for all human people on earth. It has nothing to do with religion, you noticed. It has, it has everything to do with human business, human understanding, human family, what do we want? Why, how are we going to live as humanity? So folks, buckle up, relax, just enjoy. And I hope my Facebook family have shared. Please share with someone if you haven't. If you have logged in, at least share with one, two, three people, even more. Let everyone come and gather here. Like I said, please, these are important talks. At least we know that uh, um, these internet issues, social media have been misused. Social media have been misused to propagate evil or pain. But at least ask someone, share with someone to come and listen to something good, something productive, something which will elevate the human race. We were talking about St. Paul, and I want us to understand St. Paul, I want to, to look at it at, uh, as about Paul at the altar of the unknown God. Remember, this unknown God, the other gods have been known and they are called religion. But Paul gives us a discourse and an inquiry into the altar of the unknown God. So we discussed about Paul, how Paul was different from the other apostles, how Paul understood Christ, and now Peter understood, understood Jesus. Today, it's St. Paul at the altar of the unknown God. And please, relax, come with an open mind. As usual, our, our lessons are simple, and we are precise and, and, and slow, and we tarry for one another. The myth, the, if you have questions, as usual, the phone number is on top of this recording. Or you, if you can't see it, I can simply say it. It's plus 260-977-415515. Like I said, I'm with my co-host, my wife, Lumbuka, who is going to help us, who is going to interact with us in this uh, household talk. So going straight to it, I hope you have all shared. I was trying to 
speak to you a bit before I go into our talk, hoping you are sharing. So the personality of St. Paul has been one of contradiction in theology. So we're talking about St. Paul as the author of the unknown God. Who was this unknown God whom Paul found? First, he was an, an anti, if you want, if you wish. I know during Paul's time there was no Christianity, but he was anti belief of the day, or you might say anti Christian or anti religion. Then he was, he was, uh, 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 anyway, let me put it in this way. Paul, he was actually a religious person, not anti religion, rather. I'm sorry. Paul was a religious person because he believed in the religion of the day, as you will discover in his own words. But he was anti truth. They were, remember, there were a group of people he persecuted. And those sects he, he persecuted held the views which he came to appreciate eventually. But before that, he was religious, actually. He was anti truth. And then he was pro-truth. By doing this, he managed to alienate both groups. Truth, religious people. Remember, when I say Paul was a religious person, he understood the religion of the day. He was part of it. Uh, Philippians 3, 5 says, he says in Philippians 3, verse 5, circumcised the eighth day. You see, he was religious. He followed God. He was indicted in all these rituals. Philippians 3, 5, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as starting the law a Pharisee. You see? He was a Pharisee. He was a religious guy, but he was anti-truth. Remember, I, I told you, religion is taking us nowhere. There is the truth, the absolute truth which even the religious people have fought, which Paul fought at first, and then eventually he began to understand. He would boast and say he was circumcised the eighth day. He was, a, he was a Pharisee of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was a Hebrew to the core. He's saying that as touching the law, he was a Pharisee. In the original circles, there are, there are Pharisees and Sadducees and the others. There's five, Philippians three, sorry, the six. Now we read five. Philippians 3.6 says, concerning zeal, persecuting the, the church, persecuting the people who held truth. He, he was doing it not because he was a murderer. He was doing it because he was, he was a, a religious man. He thought he was doing God a favor by killing people who believed in the absolute truth. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Meaning he understood the Jewish law. He was a smart guy, in short. This guy managed to outrage because of his uh, behavior and the way he was doing things. He managed to outrage the school of Hillel. When you go, when you begin to understand Paul, Hillel, H-I-L-L-E-L. -L -E -L. He managed to outrage the school of Hillel and Gamaliel, which he belonged to in Judaism. And he frightened the apostles to death. That's why I, I, I was saying this guy, he was a, a threat to both. The truth people, people who thought they are the truth and those who are religious. Second Peter 3.16, he says, as also in all, you see, he frightened the apostles to death. You realize that Paul, Peter writes about him in the book of Second uh, Peter 3.16 as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things which are something hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and stable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So nobody liked Paul, in short. We're talking about, I want us to understand who Paul was in the stance of what we're trying to say now. Nobody liked Paul for some reason, probably, himself and it's uh, it's sometimes doubtful from his text that he, he liked himself very much himself. Paul didn't 
care about himself. Paul cared about the absolute truth. Sometimes he didn't, he didn't, he didn't seem in his state that he didn't like himself. It was a very, very strange thing, but he was a man of destiny. What was important that he had a destiny which we can tap in. He was a man of destiny, no matter how you want to figure it. And the importance of his position is just beginning to be noticeable now. That's why I want to speak about it. The importance of Paul's position is beginning to be noticeable now. It's just beginning to be noticeable. Paul took the attitude of that when Paul was looking at what we call God. He wasn't looking at it from a religious point of view. Paul took the attitude of, of, of that deity was available to all and could be that and could be directly approached by those who wish to, sub, to, to supplicate God for one purpose or reason or another. No person between. Only what Paul is bidding when we read the, the, the 13 books of Paul is what we always say in this household. No person between. Every person Paul took the attitude of the date was available to all and could be directly approached by those who wish to supplicate God for one purpose or another. No person between. Only people who understand truth, understand God, only the noble heart. Contrite spirits in prayer and, and the dedication of life. You dedicate your life to truth, following truth. This was the basis for the Protestant Reformation, you would remember, before they, they became religious themselves. Paul's emphasis was upon personal liberties. And remember, I talked to, I talked to you about liberties. liberties. Liberty there means free to sin. No. Liberty means free to do the right thing. Paul's emphasis was upon personal liberties and the disciplining of life to carry liberty Discipline of life to carry liberty was dignity, like I'm saying. Liberty that means to be goofy or fool around or do your own thing. Liberty and the discipline of life to carry liberty, a liberty was dignity. Liberty means you're free to do the right thing, not free to do the wrong thing. Second Corinthians 3, 17. Now, the Lord is that spirit. You see the way Paul talks about God, about truth. Now, the Lord is that spirit. Remember, on this household, we, we talk to you about what is a spirit. Is it 1 John 6, 63? It says, okay, maybe you can find that scripture. Yeah, uh, 1 John 6, 63? Yeah, are we there? Yes. Can you read it for us? Um, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit. So spirit is not a spook, it's the words. You see, not any word, not the American word, not the African word, but the word of God. Now the word that he says now, or he says uh, uh, Second Corinthians three seventeen. Now the Lord is that Spirit. How you understand God? Remember, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God. So now the Lord is that Spirit, is that word, and where the word of the Lord is, where the Spirit of the Lord is, that's where Paul was preaching deep and says. Uh, Second Corinthians again three seventeen. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Liberty comes with the Word of God, with truth. That's why I was, I was telling you, liberty here does not mean you are free to do anything. You are free to go off. You are free to be. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Galatians 2 4. 
and that because of false brethren and aware brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Jesus Christ. The liberty is the liberty to do the right thing, that they might bring us into bondage. Galatians 5 1. Stand fast. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Galatians 5.13 Brethren, for brethren you have called, he says, for brethren you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. That's what Paul is saying. Like, like what I, I told you. You have been called unto the liberty only use not liberty for an, for an occasion to the flesh, but by love save one another. Liberty means the, you have, the, you have the, the freedom to do the right thing. So Paul tells us in his own words that God, Paul tells us in his own words that God put the same blood in every human being, and this is regardless of nation or race. We are all one in the circulation of blood and the spirit of God. And this, of course, would cause and did cause considerable controversy. Because other people think they are better than others. But Paul understood that in, 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 in his own words, if you go through all his 13 books, he keeps on telling us that God put the same blood in every human being, and this is regardless of nation or race. That's why I say this is for all humanity. We are all one in the salvation of blood and the spirit of God. And this, of course, would cause and did cause considerable controversy. Up to now, we still have the four races, black, white, yellow, and brown, thinking they're better than the other. I was showing the book at 17.6, where we are talking in terms of poor understanding of who we are or of what we're doing. Acts 17.26 says, And as made of one blood, one blood, all nations, he's not saying he has made four blood, white, yellow, black, and red, no. He and he has made of one blood, all nations of men, for to dwell on the face of the earth, and have determined the times and the time before appointed and the bound of their habitation. So Paul made us understand the statement also said by the Jeremy. You know, Jeremy, the British. He made us understand that statement. With Jeremy, the British made that the Jesus of Peter and the Christ of Paul. Last Sunday, we were trying to show you the difference between the Jesus of Peter and the Christ of Paul. How these two people looked at the concept of Christ. So Paul never had, we noticed last Sunday, if you listen, if you didn't listen to, to, to that talk, it's still on Facebook and on Zoom, you, you can go back and listen to it. We clarified and showed you that Paul never had a physical experience with Christ. The first experience he had with Christ was on his way to Damascus. Paul never saw Christ. For in a vision, the Lord appeared to him. So his first experience with, with truth was a vision, not a familiarity. Like Paul, like Peter would say, his encounter with truth was, was a familiarity. He met a friend. They ate fish together. But Paul, his experience with the truth was a vision, not familiarity. Not a long association, but a certain impact of a supernatural event. We can see how this affected Paul and why it changed him in a moment from an enemy of truth to one of the greatest martyred exponents. But it was definitely true that to Paul, the Christ in you is the hope of glory. And the Christ in you is, is the truth which resides in every human being, that which leads us to do right, that which, which uh, judges us. Colossians 1 to 7 says, To whom God has made known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery, it's a mystery among the Gentiles, which is 
which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And in God and in Christ, we move, we live under our being. And as and he says in this chapter, the poet said, we are his children. The poet whom Paul quoted was Arathatha, Arathatha Soli, the great writer of the phenomenon of astronomy. Imagine Paul saying, even nature shows you that we are his offspring. When you read the book of Acts 17, it says, in, and in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your poets have said, for we are also his offspring. So the poet, the poet, we, uh, this poet was Arithasa Soli, the great writer of the phenomenon of astronomy, which Paul definitely understood. So, Paul had another distinction that separated him from the group. Paul was a citizen of Rome. And in that time, this was a very important consideration under Roman rule. At that time of the siege of Tarsus, you remember Paul, he came from the, the, the place called Tarsus, and Rome sieged Tarsus. At the time, I want us to understand Paul's environment and then we'll understand how he understood truth like that. At the time of the siege of Tarsus, when the Romans came to take the city, the city did not resist, but opened the door and accepted the Romans. As a result of that, the Romans spared, uh, the, Romans spared the city completely and made certain inhabitants of Tarsus a citizen, a, citizen, a citizen of Rome. That's why Paul became a Roman citizen, because he was in the city called Tarsus, which was overtaken by Rome, and the city did not resist. So they had the privilege of being Roman citizens. That's how Paul became, was part of Roman. That's why he, even when he goes to court, even when he's killed, he was not uh, put on the cross. The Romans used to put on the cross foreigners, but their own citizens, they, they would mutilate them. They would chop off their, their head. Paul was, Paul's head was beheaded. So now this citizenship descended to Saul, later Paul, and became a basis of great many privileges and opportunities, otherwise impossible. That's why Paul had privileges to go and just preach across the Roman Empire. It was, impo it was uh, impossible according to the Roman law that anyone should be convicted or condemned without due process of the law. That's why you will notice in the book of Acts, when whenever Paul is arrested, he was never stoned or crucified. He was taken to the, to the judges to face the law. The Roman are the privilege. It was imp impossible according to the Roman law that anyone should be convicted who is a Roman or condemned without the due process of the law. Every effort had to be made for justice. This was not true for non-citizens. So Paul had this distinction of being able to travel with imperative impunity. The book of Acts 22, 25, I'll prove to you what I've just said with many scriptures. Because this is a class, so you have to be ready to have many scriptures because we don't want to speak what is in our head, but what the scripture says, the truth says. Acts 22, 25 says, And as they bound him with thorns, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is Roman? You see, because he was... He was uh, enjoying that and uncondemned 26 when the centurion heard that he heard that he went and told the chief captain saying take heed what thou doest this man is a roman because they are the privileges verse 27 then the chief captain came and said unto him tell me are thou a roman he said yeah 29 acts from 2 29 then straight away they departed from him we should have examined him and the chief captain also was afraid. It was not legal to judge a Roman, to, to give punishment, to make any punishment on the Roman citizen without going to law. After he knew that he was a Roman, he did that, and because he had bound him. Acts 23, 27, this man was taken of the Jews and should have been killed of them. 
Then came I with an army and rescued him, having understood that he was a Roman. So remember, so if Paul was not a Roman, the Jews were going to kill him at that time. So he had those privileges. We were, to, we were trying to understand this guy who came up with a different version of the Christ, which is the Christ which is leading, going to lead the whole world into enlightenment. So he had considerable language too, and was able to speak better and more often and more carefully than most of the certain uh, religious people. He was definitely a well-educated member of the school of Hillel, like I said, school of the Pharisees of Israel. So we have a Paul as a unique person, but we also have another point and quality with him, and that is not to have an intercessor because Christ in you. So this guy comes and says, there's nothing which will make you a sane person unless you begin to invoke that part in you which is called the Christ in you. Colossians 1 and 7, to whom God would have known, would have made, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So, and as Christ in you be lifted up, it will bring all things to it. As Christ in you be lifted up, it will bring all things to it. So Paul also brings out the other point that liberty, we're talking about liberty is dangerous unless it is handled with discipline. That's why I was saying the simplest way to define liberty is the, you are the freedom to do the right thing. A free person must be, listen to me folks, family, a free person must be a self-moving. When we say, when Paul was praying for liberty for the people, you must be self-moving, self-correcting, self-enlightening person. The Christ, you are at liberty because you don't need another person to take you to God. The Christ in you is a hope of glory. It was not possible for a free person to do as he pleases simply because freedom gives him this legal right. Paul was a Roman, that's absolutely nothing which made it, it, it easy for him to, to exercise this liberty he found in the truth. So freedom gives every man the right to be right. When we say we are free, that's why in the world, we take things wrong. When we say we are free, I'm free, I can do what I want. I'm free, I can wear a short skirt. I'm free, I can get who I want. No family. Freedom gives every man the right to be right. You are free to be right. That's what it means. Freedom gives every man the right to be right. In any event, Paul became a symbol of the eternal universality of the Christ mystery and mystery. Universal. As long as you have the flesh and blood and you live, it means you have the Christ in you. As long as you are human. The Christ is not a religious term. It's that thing which is in you which makes you wish to do right. Which is the hope of God, the hope of, of humanity to, to be emancipated. So it beheld a universal value. When Paul was talking about the Christ in you and the liberty, we say Christ in you is the hope of glory. He beheld a universal value, a value that was above all creeds and denominations, a level of integration that was truly a proof that one blood, the blood of God, flowed in every living thing and should be respected. I hope you're getting what I'm saying, family. So Acts 17, 26 says, And have made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and have determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation. They said, verse 27, Acts 17, 27, that they should seek the Lord, seek truth, lest they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. So, having been, remember Paul before he was a, a tyrant. He was persecuting people who, who understood the truth. So having been a tyrant and a persecutor himself, Paul spoke up strongly for tolerance. After it, he, he realized he learned truth. Remember he was a tyrant before, and having be a tyrant and a persecutor himself, 
He spoke up strongly for tolerance. Spoke up definitely that no religion must take from a person. No religion, folks, listen to me, must take from a person the right to think. Are you hearing me, family? He spoke. He was a time for he understood. That's what I say freedom means you have got the right to do the right thing. So he spoke up definitely that no religion must take from a person the right to think or take from them a right for fair decision. But only a true enlightened person could handle truth effectively. It was more than faith, folks. It was hope. And most of all, it was love. And it was a viewpoint of Gandhi. Like Paul would quote the poet I showed you. I can also quote Gandhi. It was a viewpoint of Gandhi that we can tie the world together permanently, stronger with the cause of love. That's what Gandhi told us. So here we have a man who had a very naturalistic background and was a very bitter man in many ways, who suddenly becomes the exponent of a doctrine which was not in his mind, entirely intended for the Holy Land, but to him, Israel was the world to Paul. If you read the, the whole scripture, Israel came to tell us that, I mean, Paul came to tell us that Israel was the whole world. To him, Israel was all mankind. Jesus had 12 apostles, 72 disciples, and 500 of the brethren. This is what is stated in the Bible. Therefore, he had a basic unit. The message of Paul touched all. Paul makes a great point of the human family, one unit of life. He says, of one blood, all nations. You see? A life that is embedded in the flesh, but that the soul belongs to God. One soul divided among all that live, and yet undivided. The soul we have is the soul of God. One soul in divided among all that live, and yet undivided. Each living thing, not only human family, each living thing, not only human, is entitled to justice, entitled to rightness, and entitled to address prayer, thought, and meditation to the inner life because the God who listens, the God who can hear, is the unknown God, which Paul found inscribed upon this tablet on the side of Mars Hill on the side of the hill of mass. He was to tell them of the God that they did not know how to worship. I'm trying to tell you of the God whom you don't know how to worship. That they did not know that this unknown God was the true God. The mystery of the unknown God has not been actually, has not been actually solved even today. The unknown God is still in us. But we are all lost in our sectarian games and activities, in our richest thoughts, in our philosophies. You see? So each living thing, not only human, is entitled to justice. I, I showed you before, we have corona because we did disjustice to the environment. You are going to have cholera if you do disjustice to the environment. You are going to lose fish in your legs if you overfish. Each, everything, is entitled to justice. So you, you realize now Paul is showing us of this unknown God. The story is Paul went to Matthew. Matthew was in, in, in Greece at Athens. The, the Greeks that time are the ones who are propagating civilization and, the, and you know they believed in a God and their diversity that like we have now, different denominations. So every denomination the story of Matthew shows us of how every denomination has erected an altar, different denominations, different beliefs. And then the Greeks were very clever. They knew that they were not smarter than God. So they would say, we have all these booths of different religions, but let's create one and describe it as unknown God, just in case we have missed to appease one God. So, I mean, then Paul goes to Matthew and says, these are known God. I've seen your God. I've seen your religion. But I want to declare to you this unknown God. 
Acts 17, verse 22. The scripture reads, Then Paul stood in the midst of mercy and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too religious. That's what he said. Other versions say too superstitious. Other Bible versions say too religious. Even now, we can come to the world and, and see that people are too religious. Verse 23, Acts 17, 23. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, your different religions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, marked on it. He says, Whom therefore you ignorant in worship, him, the unknown God, I him declare I unto you. Verse 24, God that made the world, he starts to explain now, is this universal God who is not religious, the unknown God. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing he is Lord of heaven, and earth dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Meaning you can't put him in a box and say he's from our church X or church B or he's in this region or he's in this philosophy. The truth is absolute. It's for everyone. It guides every human being. It has nothing to do with Caucasian, Black, African, Chinese, Indian or Jews. No. That's why I told you to, to poor Israel was the whole world. The Jews were the whole nations. You see? He says that, uh, verse 25, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything. Seeing he, give, he giveth to all life and breath and all things. So God, folks, God, my dear family, God cannot live in a house made with the hands of man. That's what Paul is saying. Whatever deity is, whatever God is, however you want to put it, is inconceivable to general humanity. That's why I say God, you cannot fathom God. The moment you start telling me about the attributes of God, is not God. Because I will ask you who made those attributes you are saying they are, they are with God. So, in, so whatever deity is, whatever God is, is inconceivable to general humanity. I showed you that we, we understand God through truth, through the absolute truth. You see? And every, you see, so whatever date is that and every veil man removes, he finds more veils. You realize when people want to explain God, they remove a veil, they find another veil. They remove a veil because they want God to be something which occupies space. God is something you cannot fathom. We lost our Zoom, folks. Let me bring them back. This is awesome, folks. Let's enjoy family, please. If you're not getting it, you can call us. The number is on the screen. Then the number is on top of this recording. And um, sorry, I'm just bringing back the, the, the Zoom family. We lost them in a bit. But they're coming back. I can see them so that we continue to, together to enjoy this message, this, this talk. So, folks, like I always say, you're free to join this family. It's your family, and when you join it, it will help you. And you're free to, 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 okay, they're back. You're free, you're free to support this family. When you support us, you're, you're not helping us. In progress. You are helping yourself, as you have noticed, I think, for those who have been among us. You're helping yourself. So God cannot live in a house made with hands of man. I was saying, well, whatever that is, is inconceivable to the general humanity. And every veil man removes, he finds more veil. Job says, can a man by searching find out God? The answer is no. But this one life is the important thing. And that this one life has its station in each living thing. This one life is divided but remains one. That's what I'm saying. We are four human beings, but we have one life. Divided in four, but means one. God made us in four. Black, yellow, brown, and white. So that we have uh, four ways of enjoying life. Four cultures working together. One life. Four, four cultures competing to do right. Competing to lift up one another. Competing to make one another feel good. Competing to love one another. <clears throat> so, but, but like I said, this one life is the important thing, and that this one life has its station in each living thing.
This one life is divided in four, but remains one. It's in everything that leaves family, and in and the, and in it, and in each thing that leaves. It's in everything that leaves, and in, and in it's everything that moves, or however you look at anything. It's not only in us, but it's in our enemy. <clears throat> Hear me, good. This life, the cross in you, is not only in you, it's also in the enemy. That's why Christ says it was said, hate your enemies. But I tell you, love your enemies because you have the trust in them. There is a hope, the hope of glory. So it's not only in us, but it's in our enemies. It's not only in a white man, it's not only in a black man, it's not only in an Indian, it's not only in a Chinese, it's not only in, in a Jew, but it's in everyone. It's in our world. It's in the animals we eat for food and even the wonderful structures of stone the crust is in there it's also in the air a mystery of life in everything somewhere in this mystery is the one in whom paul says he in him in somewhere in this mystery of of this life i'm talking about is the one in, in whom paul says in him we live and exist and of our being. Acts 17 again, 28, Paul says, For in him we live and move and of our being. As certain also of your own points, it is got it, and uh, I have said, For we, we are also his offspring. So, and therefore, family, the search for this is the search for mystery. And I told you before, mystery there means something lost or hidden. Mystery means something hidden for you. For those who, are, who want truth, they will find it. And out of this mystery came that which we now know as the Pauline mysticism. Paul's way of looking at things, which has influenced some of us to begin to look at truth as a world phenomenon. Paul was a liberator. He didn't liberate nations, he liberated souls. Just like I'm a liberator of souls, not nations. I don't need to join politics or join any human isms. So Ephesians 3 1, you listen, he was a liberator of, of souls. Ephesians 3 1 says, For this cause I call the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you, Gentiles. There's two. If you have heard of the dispensation of grace of God, which is given me to you once, it, it, the dispensation of grace of God was given, came by Paul. Verse 3 says, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mysteries, as I wrote before in few words. The mystery was what? It was that the whole world is under truth. The whole world is if you wish is religion true religion means one religion of the world he says he says that uh, for uh, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as i wrote afford in two words verse four whereby when when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of christ the christ in you the hope of glory then uh, verse five which in other ages was not made known unto the sons it, paul agreed that what I'm preaching now, before me, people didn't understand. They thought it was religion. The Jews is us and them. You know? Different denominations, but one lie. Denominator, but one lie. Religion. See? Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. What is the mystery, Paul? That the whole world must be one. That, that, that the whole world has got one life. Verse 6, that the Gentiles, remember there were Jews, Gentiles, and then the black race. So it says the Gentiles, not only the Jews, every human being, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of this promise in Christ by the gospel. It didn't say the Gentiles must be Christians. No. Remember there was no Christianity this time. Christianity came by the Romans. So stop forcing people to join your religion. This is not what the Bible is talking about. It's talking about oneness. Of this purpose, of this truth, which your human human beings must begin to ascribe to. In fact, what I prescribe is that we have one day, and it's going to happen. Humanity is going to take the whole region and throw it in the dustbin and follow the phenomenon Paul is talking about. 
So that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So to Paul, the vision on the road was the greatest thing that he ever experienced and was convinced that if a sinner as he was, was given this vision, it must be available to all living things. Because Paul was a sinner, he was a killer killing people of the truth in the name of religion. So he was convinced that as a sinner, a sinner as he was could be given this vision, it must be available to all living things. So Paul was confronted with another stumbling block though. The mind in relationship to the soul. The mind is very often the destroyer of the soul and the heart. It is the mind that excuses folly and justifies ill action simply because of expediency. So mind and soul, that's the one it tracks for us. The soul never actually justifies that which is not true. The soul, in your soul, you realize even when you do something evil or you have told a lie, in your bed sheet, in your blanket, the soul will tell you, you have lied. But your mind will, will, will just excuse follies and justify ill actions simply because of expedience. I need to lie, I'll die, or oh, I'll be embarrassed. Let me just stay a lie. That's your mind. But the soul never actually justifies that which is not true. Consequently, the mind is the slayer of the real. The mind has told you lies. It's the, it's the slayer of the real. What we see as life, normal norm, this is how we should live, this is what we should believe, we must have religion, we must change, join a, a church. It's illusion. The mind has slain the reality. And the reality is what we want to bring on the human race. The mind is the slayer of the real, and it's also, in many cases, the destroyer of the inner sensitivity by means of which an individual might have a divine experience with the God. Your mind does that, it takes you away from God. That's why Paul again says, the mind is an enemy of God. You see? So, the inner, the mind is a slayer, like I said, the soul will do that. So the inner realization of Paul, Paul also wants a great deal against soothsaying. In religion, what you have is soothsaying. If you read the, the 13 books of Paul, he warns steadily against that. Just, just like Isaiah says, wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of your times. No soothsaying. No, I see you. You are going to have a child. Your uncle has sat on your blessing. Soothsaying. Paul warns us about that. Paul also, he warns us, he warns a great deal against soothsaying and all kinds of canary in this particular area. He warns against the belief in omens. Folks, that is killing humanity in omens and all these things because they destroy, in a sense, the omens destroy the free will of the individual. And if you just start thinking now that Papa in church can, is one who can direct my life, who can think for me, who can make me strong, who will remove this burden on me. You see, all men are dangerous. All these things because they destroy your free will, the free will of, of an individual. They make him subject to something of his own inventions. He shifts his labor from his own labor. You see? And works to some magical formula that, that will, will work for him. It's magic. So Paul doesn't believe in this at all when you read the 13 books of Paul. That's why Peter says Paul, his writings are difficult, but they are not difficult. He believes that the only magical invocations, you see what, how Paul believes, he believes that the only magical invocation is a silent prayer in the heart and following truth. And, and, and I should you prayer, prayer is a your lifestyle is a prayer to God. So Paul doesn't believe in those omens. He, he talks about it in the book of Colossians 2.8. He says, beware, he's warning us, beware, let, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and then deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. People are going to the tradition of men. No, your uncle has wished you. That's what they, they are telling you in your villages by your by your medicine men, by the, by the witches. 
So also that there's for for Paul, he didn't believe in that. Colossians 2 8, 2, 8, 2 8 again, beware lest any man call you through philosophy and then deceit after the, the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. The Christ, which is the new, the hope of glory, the universal phenomenon in every human being. Also, that there is no road to conscious awakening. Paul believed that there's no road to conscious awakening apart from the perfection of nature. If we're going to awaken consciously, folks, it's not about omens or illusions or mambo jumbo, presto change or hocus pocus, hocus pocus. No. Paul understood the road to conscious awakening apart from the, you see, from the perfection of nature. There's no road to conscious awakening apart from the perfection of nature. We need to perfect nature. That's why I say we are on earth to learn the earth and grow. That's why in Romans, he also says the whole world is waiting for man to be awakened. The whole world waited eagerly for the manifestation of sons of God. So, I'll say that again. There is no road to conscious awakening apart from the perfection of nature. We have ripped the, the world, destroyed the world. We must go back and fix it. Because that was our job to be gardeners on earth, not to be tyrants like we have been. You see? Romans 8, 19. The world is expecting you to do that, to perfect it. I'm not speaking things from my head, family. I'm teaching you truth. Romans 8, 19 says, For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of sons of God, not Jesus in the sky, or angels on horses. Manifestation it's waiting for humanity to perfect the nature. The individual has to grow. Growth is eternal. It's every day, even today we are growing, we will grow some. Growth goes on. Growth like the unknown God cannot be completely defined, but growth, that is, growth is that every day we become better than we were yesterday. And that should be our motto. I need to be better tomorrow than I was that I am than I am today. Isaiah 33, 6, folks. Please listen to this family. This is what is going to help save the world. Isaiah 33, 6 says, And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. So it has nothing to do with becoming a little richer, folks. I want to go to Chase so that I can buy a car or I can have a job. It has nothing to do with becoming a little, a little richer or important to society or a little more comfortable in housing. What I'm talking about is the actual, the actual improvement must be emotion towards acceptance of light, acceptance of God or Christ in us. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is according to Paul, the oil of salvation. Hebrews 1 9. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed you with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So, the world, the word, rather, the word Christ, when you we look up, in your scripture, when you check with the anointed, be with the oil of gladness. The word Christ, Christ itself being the word for oil. In fact, Christ means oil. Paul had no reality except the Christ in himself. Any good in our lives is part of deity, folks. Anything good in you is part of God, part of deity. Every power we have is an attribute of God, deity. The misuse of any power is a kind of spiritual treason. When you do evil, it's spiritual treason. Because any, everything good in you is God. So when you misuse it, it is spiritual treason against which there is a great penalty that each person has to face. That's why we are in pain and suffering all the time. Because we have caused, we have, we have done treason to truth. In, you see? In the Orient, they call this karma. We talked about it before. The things that we do return to us in like measure. 
Anything that, uh, that has been given to us is of God. Everything, so we should treat it as such. Plants, animals, humans, any kind of type of, of human, even the grain of sand are divine thoughts. You notice when you misuse them, the earth becomes polluted. Even the grain of the sand are divine, and any use we make of them is sacred, and to profane them is corruption. What am I saying? Let's take heart. Let's change the way we eat, the way we treat the earth, the way we build the earth, the way we deal with everything. It is the God in us that is hurt. The Christ in you, the hope of glory, the oil of salvation. Galatians 6, 7, be not deceived. God is not mocked. In, in, in the Orient, they call it karma, but in nature, it's also there. Be not deceived. God is not mocked for, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall you also reap. So Jesus as a person and Christ and eternal you see, for them, so Jesus as a person and Christ and eternal fact. Jesus was a person who, who carried the Christ, which is an eternal fact. A heathen is not someone who does not agree with us. Folks. Let me let me talk to you about this. We need to understand these things for us to become true humans, for us to fulfill the longing of creation for an enlightened human beings who are going to fix the earth. You see? So, a heathen, for example, is not someone who does not agree with us. A heathen is really one who has not established the integrity within the core of himself by which he can dominate his own insecurities. Even a believer can be needed because they have not established the integrity within the core of themselves by which they can dominate their own insecurities. Paul is the only one, as far as we understand, who has finally come to the conclusion that regardless of everything, there is only one God, one humanity, one pattern of truth. We are all born into all three. One God, one humanity, one pattern of truth, born in all, into these three patterns. And as human beings, when we, when we begin to realize that there is only one God, one humanity, and one pattern of truth, then the kingdom of God has come on earth. So Galatians 4, 6, these are not my philosophies, these are scriptures. Today we were looking at Paul's way of looking at these things and how it commemorates or it adds up to us. Ephesians 4, 6 says, one God, <laughs> that's Paul, you see, and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. So we cannot solve world problems, folks. We cannot solve one world problems, family, until we discover the common life of humanity. Is someone hearing me? We cannot solve world problems until we discover the common, discover the common life of humanity. As long as they are strangers, there will be enemies. Now, if they are no strangers, there's no, there's no enemies. We are family. As long as we cannot forgive our neighbors, we cannot forgive our world. As long as our hopes are not supported by our deeds, our hopes do not come true. As long as a couple are not forgiving one another, that marriage will fail. And when we say forgive one another, when Christ says forgive one another, by this you shall be called children of the Father. It means you are going to hate one another. How do you forgive somebody you are going to hate? You need to begin to understand truth. We are human, we hate one another. But the Bible says, forgive one another. No, Pastor, I can't forgive him. He hates me. That's what it means to forgive because he hates you. So you are going to forgive someone who hasn't hate you. Then what are you forgiving? So as long as our hopes are not supported by our deeds, our hope do not come true. And, and wherever Wherever we do it badly, we suffer. And when in our suffering we raise our eyes and hands in anguish, asking God to relieve us of pain or an ache or problem that we, we ourselves have caused, but that can only work 
when we do the right thing. So deity doesn't have to forgive anything, folks. Listen to me. Deity, God doesn't have to forgive anything because it's inside of us and knows exactly what we have done at every moment. We know what we've done. All we need to do is change our lives. It knows when we are sorry. It's inside of us. So we can't start looking in the sky. It knows when we have made a proper penalty and paid it. It knows exactly the degree of our guilt and integrity. Christ knocks the doors of our hearts and comes in and breaks bread with us. The truth, the Christ in you, the truth is in your heart. So humanity is an obligation and humanity cannot fail. This I'm telling you folks, I'm telling the whole human race, white, black, yellow, brown, listen to me because this is online and I'm glad we are preaching the word of God through the rooftops, through the internet. Humanity is an obligation and I'll never stop to talk about this because I know where we are headed. The foolishness and the, and the, and the envy and the cruelty of the people now will not determine the end game. The evil will be killed. The Bible says, yet every while you wake up, you look for the wicked, you won't see them. But the, what I wanted to tell the world today is that humanity is an obligation and humanity cannot fail as long as, as, long as you and I are here, as long as there is a son of man in every dispensation sounding the alarm like I'm doing. There is no reason why humanity cannot cooperate, is my point. There is no reason why the four, white, black, yellow, brown cannot cooperate. And this has shown us that if we don't cooperate, we are in pain and in trouble. So remember, the hue of mass in Greece, that's why Greece, Greeks meant to do their religion of, or you might say, that's where, it's a place where the Greeks meant to focus it. So folks, with this, leave, go, when you go home, think about it. Come, come, let us build the, this and, and help humanity. This is real and it's going to happen whether you are in it or not. I hope this has been very fruitful for you and uh, uh, you have picked up something and it makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, you're free to ask us. I think I've spoken enough. I will give chance to my co-host, my wife, Lumbuka, Mam Lumbuka, to say something. Unless there is something someone wants to say from Zoom. Do we have folks on Zoom? Mwape, you want to say something? Before Mam Lumbuka comes on? Mwape, are you there? Anyway, I will let my co-host say something. Uh, or, not really, sir. All right. Say something or summarize or do what? Yeah, say something. So let me just excuse myself. Okay. Um, yes. Thank you very much for today's talk. It was very um, profound, um, very, very profound. Yeah, so in a summary or in a nutshell, um, you, you took us through Paul's understanding of the mystery, of the truth. I think it was a build up from last Sunday. And um, you, you basically um, talked about Paul's understanding, or rather Paul at the altar of the unknown God was, was the direction of the talk. And this was a build up from last Sunday where you you had begun to give us the two schools, the the school of Paul and the school of Peter. So today it was basically more of an expansion of um, Paul's understanding of the truth and how this can help us unlock the mysteries of the truth. And so you mentioned us that Paul um, at the altar of the unknown God. Uh, gives us an inquiry into understanding um, this unknown God. And the personality of Paul has been controversial since the times that Paul lived. 
and uh, the, the what we have as the known god is basically what we see in religion because every religious sect has a definition of what god is to them yeah but uh initially when you look at paul before he began to explain the mysteries he mentioned to us that he was an anti-truth so he was basically persecutor of the believers in those days um he persecuted the sects and later on he came to appreciate them when he began to understand the mysteries and also in philippians we see that he acknowledged that he was um a core of what they were he was if you look at the pharisees and the religious people he in philippians 3 he was saying he was them so he understood them because he was circumcised just like them um a stock of israel and of the tribe of benjamin and the hebrew of the hebrews he was trying to say i am actually all that and he was also a pharisee so when he began to um to spell out the mysteries he was trying to say that i i actually am aware of what all this is and also concerning zeal he mentioned also that he persecuted the church um which which is in the law blameless so he frightened the apostles to death when he was a persecutor and he, he all this he acknowledges yeah then also um peter in second peter 3 16 peter also acknowledged that paul's teachings which we see today that these were the mysteries um that he really tried to bring out peter acknowledged that paul's teachings were hard yeah and that's because he he was going out of the ordinary to try and bring out the mysteries of the truth out of the ordinary in in those days what the rules and the religious uh, groupings had given as absolutes so he basically went out of those and really tried to bring out the mysteries of the truth so um you mentioned to us that paul cared about the absolute truth he was a man of destiny and the importance um the the importance of his position is noticeable even now and you mentioned to us that paul took attitude um paul took attitude that deity was available to all so basically he saw that um the concept of the unknown god is for everyone it's not just for the jews even the gentiles were entitled to this unknown god to these liberties and i think this is where you took us through some scriptures that were emphasizing paul speaking about these liberties and his emphasis one on his emphasis was on personal liberties which is the the freedom to do right yeah so in second corinthians 3 17 where the bible says the lord is that spirit and where the spirit of the lord is there is liberty and we see also in john 6 63 that uh, thy word is spirit so basically liberty means uh, or rather liberty comes from the word of god from the truth and and you also took us through a series of galatians uh scriptures in galatians where this the uh, Paul was again emphasizing the liberty that we have in Christ and um, I think in Galatians 2 4 as well as Galatians 5 where he was saying brethren you've been called unto liberty and, and not do not use this liberty for an occasion to the flesh but to love but by love save one another so he was employing the Galatians to stand fast in the liberty which they have received in Christ and uh, made and it has made them free and not been entangled again with the yoke of bondage so he emphasized the availability of liberties in christ yeah and then also um in in the concept of liberty you mentioned to us that paul heavily emphasized the fact that humanity was one one father one god and Acts 17 where he says that and he has made us he has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and have determined the times before the appointed and bounds of their habitation so here i think you emphasize the point that paul tried to speak this unity among the entire um, 
human race and reminded us also that on the contrary when you look at peter peter's encounter of jesus um was more out of familiarity because he had sat with him eaten with him but with paul it was the opposite so to paul it was about christ in you the hope of glory and which is the truth that leads us to do right and you also mentioned that paul was a citizen of rome uh called uh for he was a citizen of rome and hence he had privileges which he used to be able to explain these mysteries so the privilege was that being a citizen of rome according to the roman uh, law when arrested he was not con uh, convicted unlawfully but he had to be taken before the judges and justice had to prevail so and and we see that you showed us in the scriptures in acts 22 and as well as acts 23 yeah he was a, um, a roman and so if he was not a roman he the jews would, were going to kill him and you verified that with some scriptures then you also reminded us that paul was uh, he was eloquent he was well educated from the, in the school of the pharisees of israel okay and so when he began to speak these things he was speaking from a place of um knowledge and not uh, ignorance so you also mentioned to us that the liberty which paul talked about which is a freedom we have is basically the freedom which gives um, every man to do right. It's a freedom to do right and not to do what you feel you want to do. Um, in any event, you mentioned that he became a symbol of Christ's universality, meaning this Christ in us, the hope of glory, is in every living person. And so Paul beheld a universal value, a value that was above all creeds. And Paul spoke strongly for tolerance because he was a former tyrant he knew what it is to be a, a killer a persecutor a sinner um a religious person so he heavily spoke about tolerance and forgiveness and and that uh, no religion must take from a person uh, the right to think or the right for fair decision yeah and like what we see uh, mahatma gandhi saying that we can tie the world together strongly by the cause of love and Paul, in his own way tried to explain this unity um then you also showed us that um a life embedded in the flesh uh, the soul belongs to god then you also showed us the mystery that paul spoke about the mystery of the unknown god which even up to today has not been fully solved there is still a lot to understand about the unknown God, because if we can put attributes to Him, it means we can fathom him, we can fathom Him, but we cannot fathom the unknown God, and that's because we are still lost in our philosophies and ideas of who God is. Then you took us to Acts, um, the story of the Mass Hill in Paul's days, uh, which today symbolizes denominations and has created, which has created different versions of God. So you mentioned that um, Paul stood up in the midst of Mass Hill in those days in Greece and said to the men of Athens um, that he perceived that in all things they were religious. Yeah, so he was trying to say that you're religious, you're superstitious, but he was trying to show them that this mystery of their known God is what they needed to um, to embrace yeah then you also um showed us that um god made the world and all things therein and also that um paul endeavored to show to show that to us that deity is inconceivable to humanity um because god cannot be put in compartments is he's neither he can be put in temples or in man-made buildings yeah so paul tried to show this to us and also that christ in us uh does not mean um you can put him in buildings christ in christ is in you christ in you the hope of glory is also the christ in your enemy and hence christ talks about loving your enemies yeah then you also mentioned to us that 
this this mystery of life is in everything and so that's why the bible says in him we live move and have our being so the search for this is a search for mis for mysteries and something that it means something that can be found if endeavored to search to, to be uh, to be found then also you showed us in ephesians 3 1 that the dispensation of grace uh, the dispensation of the grace of God was given to Paul. And so the revelation was given to him to show us the mystery of the Christ, the Christ principle. So the vision he saw uh, when he became Paul from Saul is, was the greatest experience uh, that he felt must be available to all. And also Paul realized that the mind is very much a destroyer of the soul. And so the soul never justifies that which is not true. So the Christ in us, the hope of glory, that beats us to do right. And Paul warns also against uh, soothsaying and all kinds of canary and belief in omens, as these are destructive to our free will as an individual. And we see quite a lot of this happening today. And also, um, he showed us also in uh, Colossians 2.8, here you are just verifying the part where Paul was warning against um, be one, uh, beware lest any man spoil you with philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, which is what we see today as religion and not after Christ. Yeah, and then ultimately you you mentioned to us that um, for the earnest expectation of the creature uh, is the manifestation of the sons of God and growth is eternal. So the whole earth is waiting for us to manifest this mystery of the unknown God. And according to Isaiah, where the Bible says, wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of their times. So it's the emancipation of humanity is what is being awaited as um, the manifestation of the Christ in us. And so you also ended by saying that anything Anything of God in you, anything, um, anything that is right in you is of God. The misuse of any power is spiritual treason, which comes with a great penalty, as we see in Galatians 6, verse 7, that be not deceived, be not mocked, uh, whatever a man sows, he reaps. And you also showed us that the Christ principle is an internal fact. A heathen is not someone who doesn't agree with us. Um, he is just that he has not established integrity within the core of himself by which he can dominate his own insecurities. And ultimately, he showed us that, one, that Paul preached one God, one humanity, one pattern of truth. Uh, then the kingdom of God will come on earth. And he showed us this in Ephesians 4, verse 6, where he says, One God, Father of all, who is above all and through all and in us all. And so you ended by saying that humanity is an obligation and that humanity cannot fail as long as there is a son of man in every dispensation. The truth will emancipate man. Okay. All right, folks, I think uh, this was awesome and uh, this is wonderful. Let's just continue meeting like this in come to class every Sunday. 9.30 to 11, and let's move together. Let's begin to, to grow and let us give humanity the emancipation they need. But it must begin in us, and let us also give ourselves as individuals the emancipation we want. So I want to thank you all. Thank you for being with us this Sunday. I think we are a bit above 11 because we always meet here at 9.30, between 9.30 to 11. Thank you for coming and from the, on behalf of my co-host. I will say I will see you next Sunday. Please invite someone, come again. Maybe my co-host wants to say bye personally. All right. See you next Sunday. Thank you for being with us.